Okay, everybody, they said the microphone wasn't working, so I've got to talk slightly loudly. So can everybody hear me at the back? Can you put... I'm only joking. They said the microphone's not working. Can you talk a little bit louder? So can everyone hear me at the back? Yeah? Right. Um, I don't know about you, but this hot weather has really messed me up. I looked at my diary the other day and it said, get the beach body in trim next week. So it's really messed me up. And I think my daughter said it all the other night. She said, Daddy, if, um, if you had the opportunity to be slim or drink wine every day, which would you choose, red or white? Because I'm not starting to see life right. Okay, so Vic Page, I'm going to talk to you about agile business analysis. And before I talk to you about agile business analysis, I'm going to talk to you about Agile in general, the DSDM Agile Project Framework, because that's what we base Agile business analysis on. And then I'm going to take you on a sort of a whistle-stop tour through Agile BA, because sometimes on presentations like this, you get people come along and go, this is a case study that I worked on, look how clever I was, or someone comes along and says, this is how you use a technique, or someone like me comes along and says, well, I am going to pass on some information about Agile Business Analysis to you as much as I possibly can in an hour. So does that work? Yeah. Yeah, so if I start talking fast, it's because I've looked at my clock and I think I've only got five minutes to go. The other thing is, I don't know if you see me limping, I have gout. I'm old, I'm overweight, I have gout and I've got a sore knee. I've taken my anti-inflammatories, but I might need to pull up a chair and sit down a little bit later on if I can't stand the pain. Is that okay? Yeah? Right. So, for the Boy Scouts and Girl Guides in the room, there's all my badges. I'm not going to dwell on them. And I do have a life, or I did have a life as well before Agile. I um, worked in BT for 20 years. Last 15 or so in software development. Um, lots of different levels. Analyst programmer, senior analyst, team leader, project manager, program manager. Moved into academia for a while, 12 or so years then went to be Associate Dean at NCC Education, did that for a couple of years, and now I do this. Any questions? No, let's move on then. Oh, look, there we go. So what are we going to do? Quick overview of what Agile is. Just before I start that, I'm, I'm assuming that everyone in the room knows what Agile is. Is that correct? Show of hands if you, you don't. Oh, I'll skip that slide then. Oh, right, we'll do it. I'll do it for you, okay? Just for you. Then we'll look at... Um, Agile Project Management, so that's the DSDM Agile Project Framework, because that's what Agile Business Analysis sits on top of, so there's bits of that that we need to understand to get our heads around Agile BA. And when we drop into Agile Business Analysis proper, we'll look at the holistic view that the BA has of the business, the Agile BA, a couple of internal and external analysis techniques. I've got an hour. I'm going to introduce you to them tell you what they are, very, very briefly go through how you use them and move on, okay? And then we'll look at um, an Agile business case, the way we look at requirements in an Agile world, a little bit of modelling, not very much, and then how we deal with stakeholders in an Agile environment, because that's all the BAE type stuff, yeah? So what Agile is? There's an umbrella there, and it's got Agile on it. Agile is not a method. Agile is not a framework. Agile is not an approach. Agile is an umbrella term for a way of working. So if anyone says to you, I'm using the Agile method, in I? They're a donut, because there is no Agile method. And a lot of people think that Agile is Scrum. It isn't. Scrum is Agile. DSDM is Agile. And this is what Agile was all about. Cross-functional, co-located teams. Way back in the mid-90s, the Agilistas thought that um, getting the business and IT working together all day, every day in the same room was cool. But as you know, as well as I do, that doesn't happen. You can't make it work. What the mantra is now is regular access to the business roles. Because once you've got regularity, you're in a position to plan. Plan on a regular basis, every two to four weeks. Co-located bits sort of went out of the window. What we're doing now is making sure that we either take the business to IT or IT to the business. We go down the route of least interruption 
for obvious reasons. Okay? Collocated cross-functional multidiscipline teams. Multidiscipline teams, not multidiscipline people. All of the expertise to deliver a solution is in that team from the outset, the development team. So cross-functional, co-located, multidisciplinary, self-organising. Self-organising sometimes get misconstrued for self-directing. And self-directing, if you take it to its limit, can be quite scary. I might be going to the lady here, right, I need you to deliver this in six months, just go off and do it. So you do, and then we get all that developer gold plating and user gold plating. That's the problem with self-direction. Self-organisation, very, very similar, but I would say to you, go off and deliver that solution in six months within your empowered role. So the self-organisation is partly about empowerment and it's partly about getting teams to work together, work in their own way, gel together and not be micromanaged by the project manager. Does that make sense? Yes, no? Is that acceptable? I think that's a yes. All right. It's about small batch sizes of prioritised work. Small batch sizes deliver quicker. If I had about five hours, we could play a game to prove that, but we haven't, so I won't. Prioritised work, because in DSDM, as we'll see later on, contingency is in your requirements. It's about communication and collaboration. That's the thing you need to get right. That's the challenge in most companies when you're doing an agile transformation. It's about iterative development and incremental delivery. The incremental delivery bit sometimes get misconstrued. People think, oh, in an agile world, I have to deliver in increments. You don't. Deliver an increment if you can get a return on investment on it before the end of the project. That's it. And all, all, all that Agile is doing, all that DSDM is doing, is pri providing an environment within which to do that. Last bit, transparency, inspection and adaption. That's the three pillars of empiricism. Transparency, be open, get everything up on the wall, let everyone see what's going on. And every two to four weeks, or however long your time boxes or sprints are, at the end have a retrospective, stand back and reflect. What are we going to stop doing, start doing, continue doing? So that's Agile. That's what Agile is, just as a little bit of, remo of a reminder. It's an umbrella term for a way of working. It's not a method and approach or a framework in its own right. Okay? So now we're going to look at the DSDM Agile project framework. DSDM has a philosophy. There it is. The best business value emerges when projects are aligned to clear business goals, deliver frequently and involve the collaboration of motivated and empowered people. So best business value emerges when projects are aligned to clear business goals. I think that's true for every project, agile or traditional, isn't it? You've got your set of strategic goals and your projects are, are put in place to actually realise one or more or a part of those strategic goals. If they don't, why are you doing them? Projects have objectives, they also have requirements, and if the requirements don't relate to one of the objectives, what are you doing the requirement for? Make sense? So that's the easy bit. Deliver frequently, that's okay, that gets the um, incremental delivery stuff in, and involve the collaboration, that's cool, we mentioned collaboration, of motivated. Let's move on and empowered people. Okay, If you can get that motivation going within your company when you're doing Agile, you're doing really, really well. So that's the DSDM philosophy. This philosophy is su supported by eight principles that we'll look at at the end of this session. There's a process or a life cycle. People, roles, we'll look at those. Products, we'll look at those quickly. And then there's um, practices, and we're going to look at time boxing and Moscow prioritisation quite quickly. And then, hey-ho, after that, we will drop into business analysis, I promise, OK? So this is DSDM's version of what is negotiable. I'm not going to run you through the sort of thought process that happened when they developed that. But basically, what we're saying, in a traditional approach, features are normally fixed. What we do in Agile is say, well, yes, bad things happen on projects. We need some contingency. So why not put that contingency in the requirements? A lot of very good traditional project managers in the 11th hour eventually talk to the project board and say, in order to deliver on time, we need to descope. And all DSDM is saying 
is, well, if we do that at the 11th hour in a traditional way anyway, why don't we do it as we go along so there's no surprise at the end and we deliver on time? That's what that diagram is all about. So that was the quick background. Now we're going into Agile PM. This is the DSDM process. It starts with pre-project. What's happening there? PMO, possibly, strategic BA, passing information to the project manager for this project, what we call the terms of reference. It's got the key business drivers for the project in it. Little more than that. You may have the names in frames for the more senior roles on the IT side and the business side. You may have a budget. You may have an end date. May, may, may. You've definitely got the key business drivers. That feeds into feasibility. Feasibility is two to four weeks long. One to two, sorry. One to two weeks long in DSDM. And what we're doing is one final sanity check to see if the project is still technically and financially viable. It's not a full-on feasibility study, it's a final sanity check. <coughs> Technically, that might be the development of um, a prototype to prove that certain things that have got technical complexity in the project can indeed be done. Financially, it may just be as simple as making sure the budget has been released and it's in the right place. What we also do is take those key business drivers from the terms of reference, morph those into an embryonic business case. So we're starting to think about the objectives that are going in the business case. We also run something called the Project Approach Questionnaire, and that's um, a questionnaire developed by the DSDM Consortium. It's got 17 questions in it, and what it's really asking is, are the business and IT in a position to play nicely together with respect to DSDM? And then based on the answers to that, it helps you decide what you're going to do in the later stages in terms of training or setting up people in different rooms or indeed co-locating. Okay? So we've, we've done our feasibility. We've passed through that. We drop into foundations. Foundations is where we do the upfront analysis and design and everything else we need to do. We call it EDUF, don't we, in um, Agile? Enough design upfront. I like to cross out that D and stick an S in, enough stuff up front, because we don't just do design up front on projects, do we? We do stuff, yeah? And after we've done this enough design or enough stuff up front, what we end up with is a prioritised requirements list at an appropriate level of granularity. Prioritised using Moscow that we'll look at a little bit later on, must have, should have, could have, won't have this time. We've also produced a delivery plan. That delivery plan has got increments in it. We've split the prioritised requirements list up into increments, drop those into the delivery plan, and as we move from the prioritised requirements list into the delivery plan, we're dropping down the level of granularity. All of that planning is done by the project manager, making informed decisions, guided by the BA, guided by the technical side, guided by the business, okay? When we drop down and we think about time boxes, those two to four week periods of time within which DSDM delivers something of value for the project, it's the solution development team that are actually doing the estimating. So that's foundations. We drop out of foundations into evolutionary development. Evolutionary development is driven by time boxes Whereas feasibility and foundations is driven by facilitated workshops. You all know what they are, don't you? You said be quiet if they don't answer, didn't you? You all know what they are, don't you? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. oh thank you. Oh, thank you. You can come again. And um, evolutionary development, driven by time boxes, this is where we actually do the work. And if you're thinking Scrum, Time boxes are a bit like a, an over-engineered sprint in a positive way, and we'll see why and how a little bit later on. So we chug along merrily, doing our evolutionary development, finish an increment, deploy. Deploy can mean anything. Deploy to live, deploy to configuration management, deploy to a release team, deploy to ops. Dependent upon where you're deploying, you have to do certain work, you have to make certain plans, you have to produce certain documentation. You plan that into your last one or two time boxes before you deploy. Deploy looks a little bit busy, 
assemble, review, deploy. It's just a bit of an aid memoir, a tick list, if you like. There's so much going on in an agile project, you've got things at different levels of um, version control. You make sure you've got the right version assembled, you check it, and then at that point, you know you're ready to deploy. Make sense? I'm sure it does. We go back, we get another um, increment, back, get another increment, back, get another increment. When we've finished all of our increments, project's finished. What we're also doing, or what the project manager is also doing during evolutionary development, is looking for when benefits in the business case should accrue. And they produce a benefits realisation plan that's got milestones on it for benefits to accrue at certain times and the level they should accrue at. And we test that post-project after the solution's been delivered. So that's DSDM. That's the DSDM process. This we call the alien baby. That's what roles look like in DSDM. And if we go through the alien baby, we've got orange roles, we've got green roles, we've got blue roles. The orange ones are from the business, the green ones are from IT, and the blue ones are more sort of project -y level or type roles. And if we look at the top one, top of the baby's head, most senior person on the project from the business called the business sponsor. Business sponsor holds the budget. They get involved primarily during feasibility and foundations. During feasibility, they are likely to be the workshop owner for most of the facilitated workshops. After that, when we drop into evolutionary development, they don't get involved very much at all. They empower one of their direct reports, the business visionary, to actually work on their behalf, making sure all the benefits in the business case and so on and so forth are that are actually working, happening and being delivered. The business visionary is also the person that makes sure that people are empowered to make decisions, they're released at a particular time. And I tend to look upon them as what I call the kick butt senior manager. If the business aren't playing nicely, you talk to the business visionary, the business visionary kicks some butt and hopefully people start playing nicely. That's what happens in Planet Agile Utopia. Sometimes in the real, real world, not always the case. Business Visionary always also gets involved in um, reviews of time boxes. When we look at time boxes, I'll explain in a little bit more detail how. We'll move over to the other side of that baby's head, technical coordinator. It's an IT role, senior IT role. And let's just say, um, probably call them the senior architect on most sort of traditional style projects. They're responsible for the underlying architecture that the solution is being delivered on. They've either designed it or understand it very well and they're aware of all the um, technical and regulatory obligations that you need to go through in order to deliver a solution of the type that you're delivering. Project manager. All I'm going to say, because we're going to talk about BAs tonight, about the project manager, is a project manager on an agile project does all the good stuff a project manager would do on a traditional project, but they jump off when it comes down to detailed planning, and they also manage by exception. That's all I'm going to say about the project manager. That's the project level roles. That's your project board, if you like. You drop down into the baby's body, which has got two arms and let's call it two feet. And the baby's body is the team doing the work, the solution development team. We've got another business role, the business ambassador. Business ambassador is someone at operational level that's got a good end-to-end -end view of the solution that's being delivered. They're there to help the solution developers and solution testers understand the level of detail of the requirements so as that they can deliver the right solution. Because they've only got a helicopter view, they may not be able to drill down enough on those requirements so they can call upon a business advisor, one of their peers, to come and deliver that expertise. We've got solutions developer, solution tester. I'm going to say does what it says on the tin really, developers write code, testers test it, we won't say any more because we're going to focus on BAs. Team leader, um, DSDM suggests that the team leader role is a dynamic role and it's the person that can get the best output from a time box at any particular time. So if a time box is predominantly test driven, solution tester, predominantly code driven, solution developer and so on. 
I've seen um, projects run with what I would call dynamic team leaders. It works. I've seen projects run where someone goes, oh, you're the team leader. They're not dynamic at all. Well, I'm not suggesting you're not dynamic, but you know what I mean. And that works as well, okay? What else have we got? We've got um, babies, oh, baby's feet. DSDM coach, could be a DSDM coach, or it could be a DSDM consultant. If you're wondering what the difference between a coach and consultant is, it's normally about 400 pounds a day. And the workshop facilitator is there because DSDM believes in an impartial workshop facilitator. They're responsible for the context of the workshop, not the content. We have a little look up to the business analyst. I'm not going to say very much about the business analyst now because we're going to drill down on that as we go through. But the reality is the difference between a traditional BA and an agile BA is the viewpoint from which they approach the project. A traditional BA tends to act as a conduit or an intermediary between IT and the business, whereas an agile BA acts as an enabler and facilitator, formally or informally. And what they're doing is they're making sure that the business advisors, solution developers, solution testers, business ambassadors, getting together at the right time, using the right approach, introducing them to certain models, so that they're getting people talking, face-to-face -face communication between the business and IT, facilitated by the BA, not necessarily, well, definitely not as a conduit. Does that make sense and feel okay? Yeah? Right. And what else have we got? Very, very quickly, if you move the um, agile business analyst out of the way for a moment in your head, what we've got up in the baby's head there is three escalation paths. Business escalation, project escalation, technical escalation. The way it normally works is the team leader escalates to the project manager who either deals with it or biffs it left or right. If the three of them can't come to a final solution, it goes up to the business sponsor as the final arbiter. That's the roles in DSDN. Sometimes people go, well, mm, where's the Scrum Master? Well, there is no Scrum Master in DSDM. If you want to draw an analogy, it's probably the DSDM coach. Where's the product owner? Well, there is no product owner. And if you want to sort of draw some parallel, the product owner is probably the business ambassador. They've got the level of understanding of the solution that the business ambassador's got, and they've got the clout of the business visionary, that seniority of the business visionary. Dangerous to draw those parallels, but if you feel the need to, that's, that's the way I would put it, okay? We've got the DSDM products here. They're quite interesting. We've got business products, IT products, management products, same colours as before. Business are those sort of orangey yellow ones, IT the green ones, the blue ones are management ones. And what have we got? We've got um, a business case. We'll be talking about that quite a lot later on. Prioritised requirements list. What's a prioritised requirements list? A list of requirements prioritised using Moscow and they're at an appropriate level of granularity. Solution architecture definition. A very short document. Provides an overview of the business architecture and the solution architecture. Business architecture, probably um, organisational chart, and um, technical architecture, a bit of an extension of what I would call a network diagram. We've got the de development approach definition, again a short document. How are we going to use DSDM on this particular project? What tools are we going to use? What's the names and the frames for the people in the solution development team? Got the delivery plan, talked about that a little bit. It's got a lot of increments in it within which we put time boxes. Last one, management approach definition. So what do we mean by escalation? How's that gonna work? What do we mean by prioritization? How's that gonna work? And so on and so forth. The swirly bit up there in green is part of the um, evolving solution. We've got models, prototypes, supporting materials, and some testing stuff. Models, and supporting materials are generally developed by the BA on a DSDM project, and they're the ones that are likely to ask for a prototype to be developed so that they can have a conversation about it with some of the um, business roles, business ambassador, business advisor. And good thing about that supporting materials thing, that contains all of that good stuff you normally do on your projects that you just cannot live without. 
until you realise that you spend hours producing it. No one reads it. And when you realise that, leave it out of the next project. And then you'll realise a little bit more when you leave it out of the next project. And that thick comfort blanket, as we move through project after project, tends to get thinner and thinner and thinner until it becomes little more than a comfort sheet, if you like. And that comfort sheet is probably only going to um, sort of hold documentation that's relevant to your regulatory obligations. So that's the DSDM products. Am I speaking too fast? If you're wondering where the accent comes from, it's Essex, by the way. Okay. Moscow. When we um, prioritise requirements in DSDM, we prioritise them using the Moscow technique. Must have, should have, could have, won't have this time. A lot of the time people get hung up on using Moscow. The real idea is to not overthink it. Must haves, if they're not delivered, will mean that the system is illegal, unsafe, or not viable. And in DSDM, we guarantee to deliver all of those must-have requirements. You can expect the should-haves, the could-haves are there for contingency. Shoulds and coulds, very, very similar. The difference between a should and could is the level of pain associated with leaving one or the other out. So if we think about, say, a student's record system, um, at the moment, students go into the canteen, there's a report up on the wall, it's got their unique ID on it, and they can find out what results they got for that semester for their modules. We're developing a new student's record system, so we really must be able to produce that report, because if we don't, and all, because if we produce that and all else fails, we've still got a student's record system that's working in that area. The students can still get their results in the same way. That's a must-have. Someone's in the um, facilitated workshop and they say, well, look, you know, we're in 2016. Why don't we make the student records uh, results available via the internet? That goes up on the list. They follow it with, by the way, um, I put a note in the Student Gazette saying they'd be able to get them via the internet after Christmas. And then someone else goes, well, OK, um, we could also make them available by um, SMS. Now, if we leave out that should have, we're still OK. We've still got a viable system. We've still got that report stuck up on the wall. It will be painful in the terms of embarrassment because some idiot has already put it in the Gazette that they're going to get their results. That's a should. The could have would be send it via SMS. No one's really known about that. It seemed like a good idea at the time, and we can leave it out. Does that make sense and feel OK? Must have, should have, could have, won't have this time. Good way of finding out the won't haves. First tranche, it's looking for those requirements in the prioritised requirements list that don't feed back to a project objective. Okay? So that's Moscow. This is a time box. So time boxes are two to four weeks long. They've got three stages, investigation, refinement and consolidation. And you can see the split there. 10 to 20% inve uh, for investigation in terms of effort, 60 to 80 for refinement, 10 to 20 for um, consolidation. Investigation, if you're a scrummy type person, is not dissimilar to sprint planning one and two. We're taking um, user stories at an appropriate level of granularity, going through the whole planning poker thing, working out the tasks, creating the task board, and um, starting our, our burn down chart. Refinement is a bit like the sprint itself, chugging along merrily, delivering the solution. But the, the key difference and the value add from a time box in DSDM is at the end of refinement, we um, have a review point, And in that review point, we decide what we're going to deliver. So if we find that our estimating hasn't been sort of particularly brilliant or the business hasn't been playing particularly nicely, we might have to leave out some could have requirements. We'll make that decision there during the uh, review session and refinement. And during consolidation, we'll finish off those bits that we said we were going to deliver. That's a time box in DSDM. DSDM's got eight principles. I've put them at the end because I'm going to say time box and Moscow and stuff like that. I'll go through them quickly. Focus on the business need. So make sure you deliver all of your musts and hopefully all of your shoulds. Deliver on time. That's coupled with Moscow and time boxing. 
Collaborate. We need to collaborate. That's more of a command than a principle, but I think it's a damn good command. Never compromise quality. In DSDM, by quality, we mean something that's fit for purpose, something that meets its acceptance criteria. Then we've got build incrementally from firm foundations. That's a bit of a play on words. If you remember back to the DSDM life cycle, you had the foundations phase, then you had evolutionary development, which is where all the incremental delivery goes on, and we develop firm foundations. So build incrementally from firm foundations, play on words. Develop iteratively, we talked about that a little bit. Communicate continuously and clearly, that's always a good one. And demonstrate control. Key word there is demonstrate rather than control. DSDM is not about micromanagement. DSDM is not about command and control. When we say demonstrate control, we mean show your projects on track. Show your projects doing okay. Stick your burn down charts up on the wall. Stick your task boards up on the wall. Have daily stand-ups. Make sure people do them. That's what we mean about demonstrate control with DSTM. Okay. Now, at last, we're going on to Agile Business Analysis. But I wanted to get your heads around what Agile is first, what DSTM is next, so you now know what I'm talking about when I start talking about Agile Business Analysis within the Agile Project Framework. Bit of history. Um, 2015, the DSDM Consortium launched um, and, H and APMG Agile Business Analysis. Initially, it was launched as a foundation only examination, and more recently, it's been set up to do practitioner as well. It's based on the DSDM Agile Project Framework that we've just looked at. And um, it puts some context around the business analyst with respect to DSDM and shows the sorts of contributions that an Agile BA should make within a DSDM project. And that's a nice pretty picture of the handbook. Bit of background. This is repeating something that I said earlier on, but it's, it's well worth repeating. Traditional business analysts work with business people to understand their need, so do Agile ones, craft detailed specifications for solutions to meet that need. Agile BAs don't. They make sure the right people are talking to each other within the business and within IT. They may craft some lightweight documentation based on notes they're taking around those conversations, but they will not be creating detailed specifications to pass on to IT. In a traditional world, they own the specification presented to the development team. BAs don't own the specifications. They don't present it to the solution development team. They present things to the solution development team along with people for them to talk to and have face-to-face -face communication. And instead of having to plough through large documents, it's the conversation that pulls out what the developers need to know. And you make sure the right person from the business is there to provide that information. Key parts of that information will be documented by the BA, put into appropriate agile documentation and be used to update various models class diagrams, ER diagrams, data flow diagrams, use case diagrams and the like. We know that the Agile um, approach encourages business and development roles to work in collaboration. I said that right at the very beginning. Not via intermediaries and that's what a traditional BA is. And not from over-engineered documented specifications and I think I've said enough about that. I, has the point been made? Yeah? Bit of a busy slide, but this is um, what the DSDM Agile Business Analysis Handbook says about the Agile BA. They're fully integrated within the solution development team. We saw that from the alien baby. They were firmly sitting in the body. They're not an intermediary, and they support communication between the business and the solution development team, not pass information on. Support communication, absolutely key. They facilitate the relationships between the business and the technical roles. And on a day-to-day -day business, make sure that the system's evolving appropriately. Doing all the normal things a BA would be doing, looking for requirements, overlap, requirements, conflicts, and dependencies, and so on and so forth. And they ensure that the business needs are properly analysed and correctly reflected in the evolving solution. How cool is that? Do you like that? Yeah, Nick. Thank you. And the BA has a holistic view of the business. So does the Agile BA. And what we're looking at up there 
So there's three levels that the BA could work at in the business. Corporate, strategy, or program and project. The program BA, looking at strategy, is generally the agile BA that would develop the terms of reference that comes in from pre-project on the, uh, the SDM life cycle. And it's very, very likely that they would not be the BA working on the project. Project level BA is going to do all the good stuff that we're going to talk about in a moment. But the key thing to get is with respect to business analysis, even in an agile world, we have that holistic view of the business. That's an interesting one. Um, we've got organisations, coupled with organisational charts and so on and so forth. Organisations run via processes. A lot of processes uh, are automated and the technology is in place for them to be automated. But right at the centre of that triangle is people. And it's the people that matters. The people have got the information that solution development teams need to know. The BAs are trained to help those people engage with the solution development teams at an appropriate level. And during solution development or evolutionary development, those people are the um, business ambassadors and the business advisors and they're talking to the solution developers and solution testers and those conversations are facilitated formally or informally by the Agile BA. So it's a very, very important diagram. It really helps you get the, your head around what an Agile BA does. This is going to be a quick bit. Um, BAs need to understand the business. And generally, at project level, BAs tend to be good systems analysts and good requirements engineers. You go up to the strategic level, and they're in a position where they've got a, a whole sort of tool bag of techniques that they can use to analyse the business itself, either internally or externally. We've got loads of internal stuff there, most resource audit, swap, towels, external techniques, PESEL, Porter's Five Forces. If you haven't heard of those, the reason why I'm putting them up is so that once we start thinking about what an Agile BA does at strategic level, you might want to go and look up what these techniques are all about, you might not. So they're just up there as something that you might want to look at. We'll have a look at one of them, PESL. So that's a way of looking um, externally, what political, economic, social, technological, and um, legal and environmental factors help with what you're doing or impede what you're doing. And I don't know about you, but from time to time, do you ever sort of start to do a presentation and you always get to the point in the presentation where you think, I can't remember what I was going to say about that slide. Do you ever do that? Because when I was practicing this at home, it was at this point and a couple of slides time where I couldn't remember what I was going to say. So I put it on a slide. And that's what you do with PESEL. I'm not going to read it out to you. You've got a copy of the slides or you can get a copy of the slides. That's an idea of um, how PESEL works. We've also got um, most. And we can just about see objectives. We can see tactics. This says strategy. That's mission. And that's the other slide that I couldn't remember what I was going to say about. So I've stuck that up there as well. Have a look at that. What do you reckon? Give me a nod when I can move on. Because you can read that. Yeah. All right. Shall we do that? We'll move. Right. Just a statement. There are two types of business case. Project and strategic. What we're worried about tonight is the project level business case. Business cases, it says up there, often undervalued and seen as bureaucracy, particularly if they're um, over-engineered and they're about 30, 40, 50, 250 pages long. But actually, they're a tool that keeps the larger, more complex projects Focused. And what does a business case do? A business case says, well, look, this is where we are now. This is where we want to be. How are we going to get from where we are now to where we want to be? A few different options that we can use to do that. It presents those options. We're going to see how in a moment. And then at the end of foundations, we'll, ex we'll um, accept one of those options as the solution that we're going to deliver. Okay? 
very, 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 very high level, very high level, those options could be as simple as desktop solution, do it on the web, we need an app. Okay, very high level, it gets more complex than that, but that's an idea or, or a way to think about it and sort of get your head around it. So don't overthink that one, okay? What does an agile business case look like? Well, that's what's in it. States the business vision for each of the options we're putting forward. There's an overview of what it is we're going to do, maybe a few wireframes or something like that. Strategic alignment of that um, particular option to the business goals. Looking at costs and benefits, obviously. Thinking about your investment, are you going to get your money back by delivering this project? And what are the things that could stop your project delivering on time and stop you getting that money back? And obviously you'll put in assumptions, risks and dependencies, but the assumptions there generally will be assumptions that you put in place for why DSDM may not work that well. And those assumptions are driven, do you remember by that project approach questionnaire, the PAQ that I told you about? They help with that. And then we come out of foundations and we accept the recommended option as the proposed solution. So that's the business case. To help us make decisions with respect to the business case, we're using Moscow to decide which requirements are actually going to be delivered. And with respect to the business case, when we're looking at business value, we're looking at the value associated with the must have and the should have requirements. We can produce models to help us understand different solutions. All of this will definitely be driven by facilitated workshops. We may even develop some prototypes in those facilitated workshops. I've been in workshops, predominantly in BT, that have been three days long. Day one has been used to suck out some requirements. The evening of day one, developers have produced a prototype to be discussed on day two. Prototype discussed on day two. Enhancements sucked out, developed the evening of day two. And then day three, the final prototype is discussed and any actions required moving forwards are documented and that's the output of, of the workshop. So that works really well. And um, if we're going to do that iterative development, we might as well time box it, but they're going to be very, very short term time boxes. The colours aren't working particularly well here. Here's a couple of techniques that I'll introduce you to that are predominantly agile techniques and they can help with um, generating information for the business case. This is called a business or a lean canvas. If you haven't seen this before, you might want to look this up, quite key to, um, to agile business analysis. You can see what's going on there as well as I can. There's a, a number of rows and columns, each with questions in it that need to be answered. The idea would be that the agile BA would gather the appropriate people in a facilitated workshop to answer those questions and use their expertise to make sure the right solution's coming out. That's all I'm going to say about the, um, the Lean Canvas. Hands up if you've not seen it before. Oh, that's good then. Product vision box, hands up if you, you've seen a product vision box. One or two. Product vision box, you, you know, it's, um, it's a game. There's a book called Innovation Games. It's about, you know, that size, about that thick, costs about 25 quid on Amazon. And it's got numbers of games in there, and one of them is Product Vision Box. And what you do is you get some, um, I can't advertise, can I? So I can't say cornflakes, so I'll say cereal box, okay? Get a cereal box, cover it in white paper, stick it in the middle of a desk, have about four or five different desks in your facilitated workshop, spread loads of stuff around on the desk, pens, feathers, you know, bits of paper, anything you can think of, magazines so people can cut out pictures and so on and so forth. And the whole idea of that workshop is to put the vision for that project on that box. Works really, really well, particularly with senior managers. What goes on the front of the box? Picture of what it is you're going to develop. What goes down the side? Well, you know, what goes down the side of other boxes? You need this amount of RAM in place. You need these different people in place and that sort of thing. I'm not going to dwell on it, but are you getting a feel for what you can do with a product vision box? If not, loads of information about it on the internet and as I said I'm introducing you to these techniques so that if you like them you go off and read about them. This isn't a session to tell you how to use these techniques, it's a session to introduce them. Is that okay? Yeah? So 
the requirements life cycle. We've got the DSDM life cycle, pre-project, feasibility, foundations, evolutionary development, deployment and post-project. But within there, requirements have a life cycle of their own. Requirements are elicited, requirements are analysed, requirements are validated and they need to be managed and documented. That's happening throughout the DSDM process. We're eliciting requirements during um, feasibility, we're analysing those requirements during foundations. During evolutionary development, we're validating those requirements against their acceptance criteria and it's the Agile BA that's responsible for the management and documentation of the requirements. In reality, that means keeping the prioritised requirements list up to date and visible. As you probably all know, instead of using requirements in um, an Agile world, we use user stories, as a, I want, so that. Doesn't look anything like a full-on requirement specification, doesn't need to, and the reason for it, that sometimes people forget or don't know, is that a user story is a commitment. That's all a user story is, a commitment. A commitment from the person that wrote the user story to have a conversation with the person who's going to use it next so as they understand at the level of detail they need to understand it at what the I want bit means. So if you didn't know that or you forgot it, just remember that a user story is a commitment. Loads of people forget that. We get hierarchies of user stories very early on in DSDM, possibly during pre-project, definitely during feasibility. We're getting objectives coming out or themes. When we're talking about user stories, a theme is a collection of um, epics or high-level user stories. We move into foundations, we're getting epics or high-level user stories coming out. We drill down, we go through, we're into evolutionary development at the bottom. We've got detailed user stories that the solution development teams can play planning poker with estimate the size of them, write out the tasks and decide exactly what it is they're going to deliver in a time box. If you want to think about that with respect to the DSDM framework, feasibility, we've got the high level requirements coming out, objectives and themes, foundations, epics and user stories and again we drop down into evolutionary development and we've got detailed requirements or detailed user stories and that's just a pictorial version of that using the DSDM framework instead of that Waterfall type approach. Anything else? Agile BA's involvement during feasibility foundations and evolutionary development. During feasibility, they're producing or helping to produce the outline business case. They're looking at how um, the IT people can engage with key stakeholders, helping to produce an outline delivery plan with the project manager based on different levels of granularity of user stories. And if a feasibility prototype needs to be developed to prove that the solution is going to be technically viable, that will be facilitated by the Agile BA. Drop into foundations. They're responsible, but not accountable or don't own the prioritised requirements list. They're actually morphing that embryonic business case that's starting in feasibility into a full-on business case, as we saw earlier on in the slide deck. They're making sure that key stakeholders at operational level in the project are being engaged with appropriately. That's the business ambassadors and the business advisors. Again, they're helping enhance the project plan and any solution prototypes that need to be developed. During time boxing, they're helping with time boxing plans and making sure that um, completed time boxes are in a position to integrate with everything that went before. So that's the Agile BA involvement. The Agile BA in the prioritised requirements list. So the Agile BA produces the prioritised requirements list. They maintain it. They make sure that what's on the prioritised requirements list is signed off by the business visionary. But the key point is down there in red. The Agile BA does not own the requirements, but they are the champion of the PRL. The PRL, prioritised requirements list, 
is owned by the business visionary. The BA keeps the prioritised requirements list up to date on behalf of the business visionary. There's a whole chunk of models up there. We've looked at a couple of them so far. It's there again for if you're not um, in the BA world and you don't do a lot of modelling, um, it gives you an idea of the, the name of the model or the technique and its main focus. It's there as a reference point for you. I'm not going to dwell on it at all. We'll look at one of them, business domain model. Most agile projects in IT, not all of them, but a good number, are developing information systems. Information systems revolve around databases. Databases revolve around data. And a business domain model allows the Agile BA to model data. That's using UML class diagram notation. We could also use um, a more traditional notation. And all I'm going to say there is we can see quite clearly that we've got three lots of data that we're trying to model. Customer, order, order item. And what we're looking at here is we read this from top to bottom. So we're looking at the one dot dot one. One customer can have one or more orders. That's what the dot dot star means. A customer can have one or more orders. You go up the other way, an order can align with one and one customer only. We go over this way, an order can have many order items. An order item is associated with only one order. It's just an introduction to um, UML notation for um, modelling data. If you've seen it, great. If you haven't, it's something that you might want to reflect on. Let's get on to stakeholders. Three types of stakeholders on a project. We know this, don't we? Project, business and external. Do I need to explain that to you? Let's move on then. So, in an agile world, when we engage with stakeholders, we want more transparency of process, less physical documentation, more frequent delivery, less upfront analysis and detail, more facilitated workshops, less large unstructured meetings, more face-to-face -face communication, and less detailed documentation. That's really summarising what I was saying right on the very first slide. And, and if we think about this for a bit, the one thing it's not got up there is small batch sizes of work. But this face-to-face -face communication, the business and IT working together on a regular basis because when you've got regularity you can plan. That's one of the key drivers for Agile delivering quicker. You know, people are under the misconception that Agile's magic, it's a dark art. It's not. Think about it. Traditional communication timeline. Trying to get hold of some of those people you need to talk to can take weeks. If you've got regular access to the appropriate business roles, that timeline, by definition, gets shorter. That's one of the reasons why Agile delivers quicker. The other one is the small batch sizes. It's been proven that small batch sizes deliver quicker. So that's why we've got Agile delivering quicker. But only if the business and IT play nicely together. That's the key thing, the collaboration and the communication. Absolutely key. How can you? So a business stakeholder in Agile has to be more engaged and more committed. What do you compare to property What we're, what we're saying is, yes, a, a, a stakeholder needs to be more engaged and more committed. It's not about the engagement and the commitment that we're talking about. It's about the time that it would take to engage with those stakeholders, get them in a room, get to have an interview with them, get to talk them, to them over the telephone. I'm asking if I, was, if I was a business stakeholder, yeah. Oh, right, OK. I understand, I, I understand what you're saying now. I, I understand what you're saying now. What would happen is during feasibility and foundations, the more senior roles, so the business sponsor and the business visionary, would be working within those facilitated workshops. You would probably have three or four two-day workshops during feasibility, so they'd need to make themselves available for that. And you probably have, again, three or four two to three day workshops during foundations, they need to make themselves available for that. 
During evolutionary development, we're engaging with people at operational level. They really must attend the review points in a time box. So in a two to four week period, let, let's call it a day per week. So does that give you a, a bit of a ballpark, yeah? Obviously, if there's quite a lot of technical complexity going on in the time box, there might need to be a bit more engagement. Would you say it's generally more than a week approach I would say it's generally less than a waterfall approach. And the reason for that would be is that you're not having to keep going back, going back, going back. Oh, we got it wrong. Can you just sign this off again? Can you give me a bit more information? They're there feeding that information in. That's my view, that's what I've seen. Others may tell you different, but you asked me the question and that's the answer that I gave you. Is that okay? Yeah, you happy with that? Good. Um, how can we, what's the word? Keep an eye on or decide how we're going to engage with our um, business stakeholders. This is a power interest grid. So we've got power and interest or influence on the um, left hand side. We've got interest along the bottom, and we've got high power, high interest people, closely engaged with them. I'm not going to go through all the other quadrants, but sitting up there and closely engaged, we've got the business sponsor, business visionary. We're working down, we're going keep informed, so high interest, low power, more than likely the business ambassadors and business advisors. And towards the other side, particularly in the um, bottom left-hand quadrant, we're talking about the wider stakeholder community at operational level, those people that aren't business ambassadors or business advisors, but will end up being users of the system. At the top, um, we've got high influence, low interest. That's a senior management team that don't necessarily need to engage at the moment. They may be direct reports of the business sponsor, but not involved with the project. But as new must-have requirements come along, if indeed they do on a project, they, need, they may need to move over to the people that you clo closely engage with. So you keep them satisfied, keep them happy, just in case you're going to be working closer with them. That's a power interest grid. The business analyst would be facilitating that. We don't keep the business analyst happy. They tend to keep everyone else happy. Yeah? And we had a good conversation at um, the Newcastle Members' Day, and... Um, we were saying, well, PMs are really important on a project. BAs are really important on a project. What, what's, what's the difference between them? And we can discuss this a little bit later on. But what we came up with, this is not me, this is me reporting on a conversation, all right? The project manager provides the glue that holds the project together, and the business analyst provides the glue that holds the solution together. Both equally important, both very different, and sometimes, dare I say it, I often look at the BA as the project manager's conscience. Think about that one. If we can't engage with stakeholders, dare I say it, we can make them up. These are called personas. And if we can't engage with a, 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 the wider stakeholder community, we can say, well, look, we've got these sorts of people that are going to be using the system. This is the age that they are, this is what they do, this is how they want to engage. And what we can do is get people to use these personas to role play in facilitated workshops. If you've got people that are good at role playing, this works really, really well. If you haven't, <coughs> that is the content of the Agile Business Analysis Handbook. Again, you can read that as well as I can. I'll just let that sink in for a little while. And then slightly later than advertised, the end. It's always got to be one of those nice emoticons at the end, isn't it? So that's me waving goodbye with a little tear in my eye because I think you're all wonderful. And if you want to contact me, there's my email address. So thank you very much for listening. Have you got any questions? I know we've got some as we went through, but are there any more? Yes, sir. Let, let, me, get, let, let me get closer. Yeah. Is there a 
th there's no rule of thumb or anything in the handbook that states that. You say, start with a won't have. Where that's come from is there's a couple of techniques that we can use in facilitated workshops to do Moscow prioritisation. And one that I've seen used is the facilitation. I'm going to walk back down here because I don't want to ignore these people. Is that all right? One of the techniques that's used is um, a facilitator will put all of the requirements up on the wall, put a W next to each one of them, and then they'll go around the room and the owners of those requirements have to convince with evidence-based reasoning, not I can shout the loudest or I'm the most senior, evidence-based reasoning why those Ws should be Cs. Then when we've done that, we go around again for the S's, we go around again for the M's. So that's where that come from, but there's no rule to say that that's the way it should happen. Another way of prioritising requirements in a facilitated workshops is to play a game from the Innovation Games book that I mentioned earlier on called Buy a Feature. And what we do is stick all of the requirements up on the wall, give them an arbitrary monetary value, add them all up, take 60% of that value, spread it evenly amongst the people in the room. Who wants to buy a feature? Oh, me, I'll have number one. Right, OK. Then money starts to run out. I know that this guy and this guy could probably be doing with the same feature. I'll wind them up a bit, get them to pull their money, buy that feature. Then other people in the room will start doing it. Then the money completely runs out. And then we go, right, oh, OK, so... Uh, Still some stuff up on the wall there. Is that important? Does anyone need to? Oh, yeah, that is it. That, yeah, that's some of the stuff up there. 20% more money. Out come the coulds, yeah? Or out come the shoulds, rather. And again, same argument for the could have requirements. By a feature, I don't know why, but I'm just reporting on observations that I've made. By a feature works really well with senior management teams for some reason. Boom. Did that answer your question? Thank you. Any more questions? Yes. Mm. I, I, would, I would not, in any way, shape or form, try and align the business analyst to the product owner in Scrum. For me, I don't like drawing analogies between roles in DSDM and roles in Scrum, but I think I said earlier on, the product owner, if you want to align it to the roles in DSDM, has got a, a level of understanding of the solution that the business ambassador's got, but the level of seniority that the business visionary has got. And with respect to Scrum, I don't knock Scrum, I don't knock Prince 2, I think Scrum is really, really good at delivery. It's excellent. And the Scrum Guide says, Scrum starts with a backlog. Doesn't say where it comes from, it starts with a backlog. Because Scrum's got no concept, because it doesn't have to have, of project managers and BAs, when you start thinking about, well, where does that backlog come from? Oh, well, it's a project backlog, really, and the BAs have probably helped with that, and there's probably other stakeholders that are feeding into the product owner so then it starts to become a little bit clearer and then you get the idea of why DSDM has got those other business roles in it other than the product owner. But I would never align them or, or the PO to the BA. I would look at the BA as one of those invisible people on the other side of the product backlog that supports the product owner. That's what I would do. Pardon? The missing link. The missing link. Oh my goodness. Yeah, so what all BAs walk around like this, do they? <laughs> Was you filming that? Because if you missed that, we're going to have to do it again. <laughs> that was really good. That was the best part of the night, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah lovely. Any more questions? Yes, sir. And there was a big argument about that because as far as they were concerned, there's in, in terms of payment milestones and contractual obligations, mm. you can run Agile in that space. Let's, let's look at it from a contractual viewpoint, okay? And um, 
What we're really looking at in terms of a sensible approach to an agile contract is fixed price, fixed spec. And if we go fixed price, fixed spec, that's sort of agile-ish, but we haven't got that shorter delivery, on-time delivery. Um, also with respect to agile contracts, not my area, however, I know a person whose area it is. Many years ago, there was a lady called Suzanne Atkinson, and she developed the first agile contract for the DSTM consortium. Several years back at the Agile Business Conference, she presented it. There was a couple of other um, law firms there who systematically pulled it apart, and at the moment, they're all putting it back together again, and rumour has it that there's going to be a new Agile contract on the DSDM website before Christmas this year. How cool is that? You are so pleased you came tonight, aren't you? Yeah? That is fantastic. Let, let, let's shake hands. That was brilliant, wasn't it? I bet you're really pleased. There you go, my friend. Any more questions? I'm preempting one, but unfortunately there's no free bar. But if you fancy a beer afterwards, I'm going to the Albion. Yes, sorry. Yeah. What, what are the main challenges that probably you, would you expect to be used? The DSTM techniques actually aren't relatively new. They've been around since 1995, since DSTM was around. And DSTM techniques are Moscow prioritisation, time boxing, facilitated workshops, modelling and iterative development. It used to be called prototyping in the old days. Did you say something about 2015? That's when we brought our agile business analysis. Uh -huh. Yeah. The challenge is, forget the techniques, the challenge with Agile, the real challenge with Agile, is getting people to play nicely. Getting um, middle management to release people at operational level on a regular basis, empower them to make decisions. That's the issue. The, the other issue is getting senior management to accept that they're not going to get everything. We do this thing called Moscow, and there's must, shoulds, coulds and won'ts. But once you get them in a workshop and you get them thinking about it and you either stick all the C's up on the wall or you play the money game, it starts to sink in. But they're the challenges. Getting the senior management people to accept that they're not going to get everything, that that is difficult, and then getting middle management to release and empower people. But they're the challenges. Once those challenges are overcome, then the techniques are just there and you use them. And if we think about it, Moscow prioritisation, well, I put that forward as a challenge, didn't I? Time boxing, that's just there to deliver stuff, isn't it? And for people to have conversations about the stuff that's being delivered. So once the business are playing nicely, that's cool, yeah? So Moscow Prioritisation Time Box facilitated workshops help us with that collaboration and communication. So as a technique, they're a helper to get the business play nicely if you've got a good facilitator, yeah? Then we've got modelling. Modelling is a helper for the BA it's a lot easier to have a conversation about a model than it is to plough through a very, very large document. Because when you, when you look at a model, you inspect it. Yeah? In fact, if we got, um, I think we've got a flip chart here. I'm going to hope that the pens work. All right? So, I could come in and look at your department, analyse your department, write a very large document, get you to look through that document, and you'd be looking through it, wouldn't you? And, and this is no reflection on you, but you, you know what I mean. Yeah, oh, yeah, page one, yeah, two, yeah, yeah. Page 300. <laughs> oh, sod it, I'll sign it off, and the rest of it's crap, right? That's why we get bad solutions delivered. I could do that, or I could say to you, right, OK, we've, we've been in, we've looked at your department, and uh, here's you and your department. We know it's you. Nice big smiley face, OK? And you engage with these four processes. You take information out of that one, kick it around a bit, stick some information in there. Bit of a two-way styly going on here, and you update information in that process. You can inspect that very, very quickly. Go, you got that right, you got that right. That's not a two-way styly, it goes that way. And you've got the wrong process here, it's that one. That's how models help. Does that make sense? And then the last bit was prototyping similar argument to this, but with code. Is that okay? Any further questions? Go on, you want to ask one, don't you? Yeah, I mean, before the Agile was invented, mm. how were those functions served? 
That's a very good question. Um, could I just be quite blunt and say I don't think they were, and that's a terrible shame. And that's why, if we go back to the early 90s, shall we say, when we had rapid application development, those functions weren't served, the cowboys came in, it all went belly up, and then the DSDM consortium came in and said what we need to do now is look at RAD, and what we want to do is cherry pick the good bits from RAD and try and get a framework in place to make it happen properly. And as part of that framework, they had the roles and they introduced the Agile BA then. So the, the answer, the quick answer is, didn't happen. Doesn't happen in Scrum, even now, sadly. However, what you do find is Scrum will be implemented, say, at um, development level, so the testers will... Can you repeat the question? Can you repeat the question? <laughs> Yeah, is, uh, uh, the, our friend here said, um, what happened to the, um, what BAs do in an agile environment before you brought the BA in, wasn't it, really? And I said, sadly, nothing, it didn't happen, and DSDM brought the BA in and made it happen. Scrum, implement Scrum, got a software development team, yeah, give us a backlog, chug along merrily. Yeah, no concept of business analysis. You're probably going to get requirements overlap, conflicts. And when we start thinking about technical debt, oh, I wonder where that came from. And it goes on, yeah. When you start using DSDM and you've got the Agile BA involved, that technical debt is not going to go away, but it's going to diminish significantly, in my opinion. That's, that's the best answer I can give you. Was that OK? That's good answer. Thank you. Yeah? All right. Thanks. Anyone else? Yeah. yeah. Oh. <laughs> right. Yeah. If you go to the BCS, Absolutely. you can buy a couple of very good books on how to be a BA. One yeah. is about the techniques. Yeah. Are those traditional learning methods still valid for the, for the Agile BA? Yes, they are. Um, I, I'm a freelancer, and I work for several training organisations. I've also got my own one. And one of the training organisations that I work for do the um, BCS BA diploma. I actually teach on that. I, I teach requirements engineering and software development essentials. And quite a lot of the people that originally came on the Agile project management course via this ATO were BAs that had done the BCS stuff and they wanted to get an idea of the Agile environment. And it was because of that reason and other ATOs that was feeding this back that we developed the, um, the Agile BA award. So the stuff that they learn in the BCSBA diploma doesn't get thrown away here. And if we go back to this slide, most of what they learn is on there. And I'm not going to go clicking all the way back to the beginning, but do you remember the pestle, the towels, the swat and so on? They learn that as well. So it's still used, but it's, it's not used to a level of detail where you're going to produce a 250-page document. It's used to a level of detail where you're going to have a discussion in a facilitated workshop and make a decision. Makes sense. Yeah? yeah? Is that okay? Good. Any more? Got a question from Whoppy? No? no. <laughs> Any more? I used to be an auctioneer. So for the first, second, third and last time, <laughs> unlucky. Over. Thank you. And now it's all to the Albion. <laughs>